evidence of what happened exists. And that's why we need to demand an investigation. Is this blood on the wall? Yes, it's blood. We are not building Terminators, Slaughterbots. You pick your version. CVS Health and Aetna won approval for a $69 billion merger from the Department of Justice, which means America's largest pharmacy chain and third largest insurer could negotiate drug prices without the usual middlemen. Last year, CVS Health filled prescriptions for about 94 million people, while Aetna covered 22 million. The giant healthcare merger follows another that got DOJ approval, a $67 billion deal between Cigna and Express Scripts. Brett Kavanaugh secured his spot on the Supreme Court, but he forgot to secure his website. Advocacy group Fix the Court, which bought the domain three years ago for a $13 annual fee, set up a page that directs visitors to nonprofits that help victims of sexual violence. U.S. prisons are keeping more than 4,000 inmates with mental illness in solitary confinement, despite evidence that isolation can hurt them psychologically and despite American Correctional Association rules that forbid the practice. A Missouri judge has barred state election authorities from forcing voters to present photo ID when they show up to the polls, blocking a key part of the state's 2016 voter ID laws. Voters will still have to prove their identity, but can use a range of documentation, including a voter registration card, utility bill, bank statement, or paycheck. Missouri's Secretary of State says he plans to appeal. It is my pleasure to host this event. Uh, the topic, of course, is the new face of Saudi Arabia has anything changed? Saudi Arabian journalist Jamal Khashoggi was originally scheduled to be here at this think tank discussion on political reforms in his country. Thinking a lot about Jamal, as everyone is, it's been a week since we've last heard from Jamal, since he went into the Saudi consulate. Evidence of what happened exists, and that's why we need to demand an investigation. Instead, he's missing and presumed dead after he walked into the Saudi consulate in Istanbul eight days ago and never walked out. Khashoggi isn't just any journalist. He was a longtime regime insider who became a columnist for the Washington Post, where he poked holes in the reformist image of the man who took power last year, 33-year-old Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, or MBS. Corruption is no secret in Saudi Arabia. We feel it, we see it every day. That Khashoggi was an irritant to MBS is not in doubt. What happened last week, though, still is. So far, the key evidence comes from another authoritarian source, the Turkish government, which tracked a pair of private jets owned by the Saudis that they say landed shortly before Khashoggi disappeared and took off soon after. A pro-government paper says the planes unloaded a squad of 15 men who went in and out of the consulate. But they haven't released all of their evidence. And Khashoggi's fiance thinks he might still be alive. American lawmakers are determined to get answers. Tonight, more than a dozen senators sent a letter that triggered a law requiring the White House to investigate. But human rights isn't the Trump administration's top priority. Thank you. Saudi Arabia has been a key military ally for decades and the largest buyer of American-made weapons. Yesterday, we signed historic agreements that will invest almost $400 billion in our two countries. That may be why the administration's response has been so subdued. You had mentioned that you spoke to King Salman, so... I mean, well, like I do that. anyway, and uh, I've always found him to be a fine man. We've had a very good relationship. I'm not happy about this. We have to see what, what happens. How can the United States continue to reconcile support for the regime of MBS? It's also why critics aren't optimistic. The Khashoggi incident might be shocking, but it isn't new. Dozens of dissidents have been rounded up since MBS came to power, including the very activists whose protests led to women finally getting the right to drive. We know now. Uh, we, sh we, we know the behavior. You could expect uh, the events uh, through the pattern that is taking place in Saudi Arabia. Abdullah al is an academic who lives in the U.S. Last year, his father, the cleric Salman al-Oda, was arrested over a tweet. He now faces the death penalty. 
it's a fight, uh, you know, against a very dangerous and thugged style governance, but we will still do it. It's a matter of life or death to us. In a way, no one's safe. Exactly, no one is safe, unless we uh, hold the perpetrator accountable and, uh, you know, bring him to justice. This is a mass grave on the edge of Kabul, where victims of one of the deadliest suicide attacks to hit the capital in years were buried by their families. They're all under the age of 19. At least 34 students were killed, and more than 57 were wounded in the August bombing. Attacks on so-called soft targets like these have become increasingly common across Afghanistan as the government struggles to contain the Taliban and the emerging threat from ISIS. What about this idea that things are improving? This year is on track to become one of the deadliest for Afghan civilians since fighting began 17 years ago, according to a report released today by the UN. Mohammed's son, Hamid, was killed instantly in the blast. His younger brother, 17-year-old Wahid, was badly injured. This is the first time Wahid has been back inside the school. My brother was sit on there. And uh, I was sit on there at the end. Are we here? Yes. They were studying for their college entrance exam when a teenager, strapped with explosives, entered their classroom and blew himself up. Is this blood on the wall? Yes, it's blood. This is another class. This is another classroom? Yes. So this was a wall before? Yeah, this was a wall that... The, 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 the bomb, bomb was... destroyed it all? Yes. So what was it like when the bomb went off? When the bomb exploded, my back is by first. And we pushed him to the city, like Fishori, the the all for the pass of Totum, the Rizimitic, and we Gushim, Gushim, and Sadoi, Bissior, Badradot, the Mauj, and to Sortonda, and we Gushim, and Sarisha Kamak Sortabut. It's no Gardohog, the old Buddha. And we were to ask them, Kato Hun and Adabudum, Hun and Adabudum, the Inja, as Hossi Bidun Sara did. Doesn't have the head. Doesn't have the head, and the red eyes casual, but as she comes, my friend, as Lozi, it's too late not to listen. Ki tashkiz bittim ki biyadarim as. Ma ame as duri perohani shi nohtim ki ame biyadarim as ki ame shayi shi debut. Dekhi har shau dekhau ame dekhau nado. The belongings of the dead students were collected and placed here in an adjacent classroom. Wahid and his aunt are looking for anything that belonged to Hamid. It's the remnants of a class that will never graduate. From a generation that's known nothing but war.
With his brother's death, Wahid now has to do his studying at home. His parents have decided it's too dangerous for him to return to school. What would you say to Americans about the situation for families living here, families like yours? Young immigrants don't always conveniently cross the border with a birth certificate, but how old you are is critical to the immigration process. The difference between 17 and 18 is the difference between being placed in a shelter for kids and being sent to an adult detention facility akin to prison. But when the Office of Refugee Resettlement, the government agency that takes care of undocumented minors, can't figure out someone's age, they've been resorting to a murky and disputed branch of forensic science, dental analysis. If a detainee might be an adult, ORR takes them to get x-rayed. A forensic dentist then looks at images of their wisdom teeth, rates them on a developmental scale, and compares them to existing data. Sometimes this means plugging these ratings into a computer program, along with the person's race and sex. The program then spits out a range of ages, sometimes as wide as six years. Dr. David Sen has performed about 75 of these exams just this year, mostly for ORR contractors and ICE. My understanding of the immigration people's responsibility is that they have to take a holistic approach. They have to look at all of the available evidence and then combine all of that evidence into a decision about whether or not someone has reached the age of the majority. That is not a decision that I make. We are just reporting data based on the development of the team. Forensic odontologist Adam Freeman used to study with Dr. Sen. They've disagreed about the use of other forms of evidence in the past, and they disagree now, too. If the best you can do is plus or minus three or four years, then that should bring some great concern to anybody using this technique for the purposes of developing an accurate, specific age of a person. The American Board of Forensic Odontology says that analysis of x-rays can play a useful role in determining age, but like Dr. Sen, it also advises considering other methods. Congress agrees. A 2008 law already prohibits the government from using dental records alone to determine someone's age. But ORR has broken that law and got caught doing it. In 2016, a federal judge found that ORR had used x-rays alone to send a Somali boy to ICE detention. The judge ordered that the boy be returned to ORR custody. In email records obtained by Vice News from April of this year, a Southwest Key Shelter for Immigrant Children referenced a dental examination in a memo announcing a young immigrant's immediate transfer to ICE detention. Dr. Sen said that he did not perform that examination. Southwest Key and ICE both declined to comment, deferring to ORR. And ORR just directed us to their policy guidelines. We don't know how often the government is conducting these exams or how often teens are being sent to ICE because of them. What we do know is that everyone from Congress to the dentists themselves agree the science could be better especially given the consequences. There's a controller that moves it up. 
And you could also tilt it in different directions. This is like a like a guard dog, like it's like in front of you and like you have your gun and you're shooting and this is the shield. You could, or, or it could be for a crowd control situation. Okay. You might not have a lethal weapon. The idea of military technology is scary because it seems like the most brilliant scientific minds are inventing the most creative ways to tear human bodies into little pieces. But the reality of TARDEC, the Army's Tank Automotive Research Development and Engineering Center, is a little more banal. This is fun. These machines are not killer, just killing adjacent. We actually work from these small size robots here all the way up to the, the very large trucks. Developing warbots isn't a new interest for the Army. Their first was built back in the 1950s, a remote-controlled roving platform called Little David, made in response to a German one called Goliath. Troops in this area call it the Doodlebot. Since then, the lab has come up with all sorts of gear and gadgets, though most never make it into the field. But one technology that is expected to be used by troops next fall is called Leader Follower. It's a system in which a manned truck can have any number of driverless trucks follow it in a convoy. About half of the Army's war-related fatalities come from IEDs, and Leader Follower means fewer humans are exposed to them. How does Leader Follower work? So Leader Follower is a combination of a bunch of sensors that are fused together to follow something in front of it. So we have cameras that work like your eyes. We have radar, sends out a radio signal, it bounces back, calculates the time. We have LIDAR, which basically works just like a radar, but sends out a light signal. So all of these things allow us to track and build the world around us. So one vehicle can tell the one behind it, like, okay, I just went over a pothole. It's not so deep, so you can drive over it, or maybe you should go around it, that kind of thing. Correct, but we actually use a cheat. The really hard problem of perceiving the world and knowing where to navigate on it, we're still letting a man in the loop do that. Do you feel like Alfred in Batman? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. Uh, I'd go more for the Iron Man analogy, but... <laughs> Iron Man, okay. <laughs> like most people who work at Tardec, Tyson is a civilian. So two or three times a year, they host soldier innovation workshops, where soldiers work with designers to draft new ideas to figure out how to make the next generation of warbots. So I think the number one request we get from soldiers and Marines is, when are we going to get a gun on this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So everybody wants to be able to put a weapon on the robot to get out to, to be able to fight. We are not building Terminators, slaughter bots. Um, you pick your version. The Army has an explicit rule that humans decide when to kill. That's why the persistent killer robots question annoys Robert Sadowski, the Army's chief roboticist. We are looking at how I remote the lethality. It's not the same thing as making a robot that I'm just going to throw out there all by itself and say, go out, hunt, and destroy. Okay. Remoting the lethality, that means making soldiers better at killing the enemy from a greater distance. Yes, and it's not from thousands of miles away. I keep trying to tell folks that maybe half a terrain feature away. I have to maintain positive control of the system. Do you think robots will make it easier to win wars? One would hope so. Again, I want us to be the ones who make it easier to win the war. Do you ever like lie awake at night and think like, what if I'm making terrible machines of death? Uh, a tank itself is a terrible machine of death. I don't look at it that way. I'm not like naive enough to say, oh yeah, I'm building killer robots and I'm not worried about the potential implications. I'm very worried about making sure that we build systems in such a way that we understand what they do, we understand how they can team with soldiers and how they can provide them an advantage. Does making these kinds of missions less lethal for the American side mean politicians are more likely to want to Engage in so warfare. remember, this is a hybrid formation. I keep trying to tell folks, there are people there. Sadowski's point is that we're a long way from the fully autonomous Energizer Bunny-esque robot dogs in Black Mirror. Not necessarily because it's creepy or unethical, but because we don't have the battery technology to power it. And they're not smart enough to operate without humans. Oh, okay, so like if I was tied up shooting at bad guys, yeah. he could you take over. For now, war robots will do yeah, more I mundane tasks, just, uh, like uh, follow a truck while then carrying then a lot of stuff over a smooth terrain with few trees. You could hand over your 
vehicle into a robotic mode, and now your commander can be controlling it. So you could either do training or maybe return fire on an enemy. Okay. Or you could like check Instagram. Or check Instagram. <laughs> Oh, the world ended. Oh, <laughs> Robot music. Oh, come on. This is getting really Freudian. Yeah, right away, that's Calvin Johnson singing. This must be a new thing he's yeah, doing. Yeah, that's really great. He's making teenage symphonies. Yeah, smooth production for yeah, Calvin. Really, well, it needs to be the new theme, the theme for the new 007. <laughs> Look at this good love we've wasted. Mm, another good thing gone. Nice kind of Memphis sound there. Yeah, I feel like it kind of harkens back. Yeah, yeah. The day has gone by in real kind of simple instrumentation and voice is gritty and... I want to hear the voice really like open up. She could have came on a little stronger. I felt like she was holding back on you. Hold back a little bit. Maybe, but maybe, maybe that was the maybe intent. The yeah, maybe that was the intent. Huh. Wow, pretty bold coming out right at the top with the flange on the guitar. It's got like a Steely Dan vibe to it. it kind of felt like the beginning of like a late 70s, or maybe yeah. right, right on right, 80, like a yep. sitcom. Yeah. <laughs> It gets pretty trippy in there, yeah, and the vocals sound more like it just breathed in helium. <laughs> it's hard to tell whether that's super manipulated voices to where this, or if it's, it's like, a totally different voice. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. You know, it's been a few decades trying to get so the technology kind of forcing it to perfection, and now we're trying to figure out how to destroy the perfection. It's a genre that's defined as glitch, microhouse, avant pop. I'm not from personally familiar with that genre, but. Those words seem to work. <laughs> Those to words work, describe work. it perfectly. 